Hi there, Matt Easton here of Eastern Antique Arms and Scholar Gladiatoria. So, what we're looking at today is Britain versus France, that age old rivalry. But specifically, we're looking at the 1845 pattern sword from France and the 1845 pattern sword from Britain, in both cases for infantry officers. So, first up, let's just have a quick look at the swords before I um, go into a load of speaking. So, this is an 1845 um, model sword. Um, referred generally to incidentally in France as a model, in Britain as a pattern. Um, the scabbard of this dictates that this will often be known as an 1855 um, model sword in France. However, the model of sword essentially is the same. It's really the scabbard that changed. In 1845 they had a um, brass and leather scabbard and in 1855 they got a steel scabbard. Okay, so this is the French sword, very nice blade, as I'm sure you can see, with a brass hilt. Similarly, the British sword, the 1845 pattern infantry officer's sword, has a brass hilt and um, uh, a different style of blade. Now, very briefly, before I go into comparing and contrasting these two swords, um, I'll just show very briefly what went before in both cases. So in France, the 1822 pattern was looking like this. So a slightly more minimalist guard, so slightly less protective guard. And you can see a, a blade which is more similar, in fact, to the light cavalry 1822 pattern blade, a fullered blade with a little bit more curve and a point, this is important, a point located to the rear of the blade, like a, like a cavalry sabre continued to be in France. Now, in Britain, we had a pipe-backed blade from 1822 um, until 1845. Um, this is an example of one, however, it's not a great example because this is a very unusual one. This is actually an example made by Prosser that is exceptionally wide and heavier than normal and as such is a better blade than the typical one. The typical one is more narrow than this and doesn't usually have this flared um, sort of full sedge or yellman at the back. It is what we normally find on Navy officers' swords, not usually on infantry officers' swords, but this is an inf infantry officers' sword um, marked to William IV. So it's pre-Victorian. Um, nevertheless, this is a pipe back blade, that being that it has a rod section at the back and then um, flat more or less in front of that. Um, also, aside from that, so those are the two swords that came before the 1845s. Um, interesting to note that in France in 1822, the infantry officers of both France and Britain obtained new models of sword. And then in 1845, again, both in France and Britain, infantry officers gained a new model of sword. I don't think this is coincidence. I think this is partly to do with Anglo-French relations, competitiveness, um, keeping up with the, the most rivaled neighbours. I don't know, something along those lines. Um, but one thing to mention as well is that this type of sabre in France was used by junior officers and adjutants and also non-commissioned officers, so sergeants and corporals. Um, so this was the officer's sabre and non-commissioned officer's sabre for the lower ranks. Um, the higher ranks, for some reason, unbeknownst to me, and I don't know anyone else who knows the reasoning, although it might be contained somewhere in some French text, um, they used a straight double-edged thrusting blade for the higher ranks. Maybe, I don't know, maybe they thought it was closer to, um, to an epée blade, maybe they thought it was somehow more representative of higher class, or Perhaps it was simply that they thought that they were less likely to get into combat if they were above the rank of major or whatever. I don't know. Um, but uh, in Britain, that wasn't the case. In Britain, um, after 1845, the um, officers basically kept the same model of sword right the way up to the rank of general. When they became a general, um, they did have, there was a general um, officer's model of sword, the 1831 Mamluk type of um, sabre. However, on campaign, generals would generally wear that for dress, but they'd wear a proper sword, a fighting sword for um, for campaigning. Famous example is Colin Campbell. Um, photographs of him from the Indian Mutiny show him wearing actually something that looks kind of like that. Uh, it looks like an old 1796 um, cavalry sabre. So generally speaking on campaign, officers could, in reality, especially if they were outside Europe, 
pretty much choose to carry whatever they wanted. So if they wanted to carry an old uh, family sabre or um, a, a cavalry sword because it was bigger, then they could. And in fact, in India, many British officers did elect to wear um, tulwars which isn't necessarily because they thought they were better weapons. I know of one example where an officer is photographed wearing a tulwar, but actually uh, we know that on service he had a, a cavalry sword, a Wilkinson cavalry sword that he used. So it could sometimes just be because it was the local fashion or because they wanted to show more kind of um, uh, camaraderie with their um, Indian troopers. I don't know. Could be many reasons. Right, back to the um, British and French 1845 patterns. So in the broadest possible terms, they are similar-ish swords in that they're both similar weight, similar-ish length, although we'll talk about that in a minute, and they've both got brass hilts and obviously steel blades. Um, now, there is a bit of a difference. Let's talk about the blades to begin with, okay? The blades both have what we call a spear point. You'll see that the points of both are located in the center of the blade. That makes them better at thrusting. Remember what I showed with the point of the earlier French sword, which was located to, in line with the back edge? They generally are worse at thrusting because as soon as you impact with something, if I just put the British sword down for a second, as soon as you impact with something, if the point is located at the back, the uh, back end of the sword will want to divert out. Or indeed, what will happen is it will skim off the target if there's any kind of resistance. So if it hits bone, for example, if the point hits bone, it will slide off away from it. Or if it hits... Um, a buckle or um, some kind of thick clothing, a thick winter coat, for example, like in the Crimean War, it's more likely to divert and less of that energy is going to penetrate through what you're trying to thrust through. So a spear point, much the same reason as a spear or a lance has a central point, you want, if you want good penetration with a sword, you want a central point. If the point is located towards the back on something like this 1803 or indeed a talwar, it is always going to be more difficult. It's not to say you can't stab with it, but it is always going to be more difficult to get good deep penetration with it. Right, so back to the sword. So the, um, the French sword, like the British sword, has a central um, point, spear point, very similar. Okay, Both have false edges. That is, they are edged down the back edge for about six to eight inches. It depends, it varies from sword to sword. And it varies slightly. I'd say the British ones tend to have slightly longer false edge than the French ones. You'll notice that the British one has a single fuller, much like the earlier French one, actually. Um, and like most other swords with fullers, to be frank. But the French sword has not always, but very, very usually and very often, a double fuller. And you'll notice there's a thinner fuller right at the spine there. So we've got the main fuller here and a thin fuller at the back. And that is known as the Montmorency style. Now you'll see in this example that continues all the way almost to the tip. It doesn't always do that in these French swords. Sometimes it only continues to the beginning of the false edge and ends there. So there is variation between these uh, French blades. Um, this one is not named on the back, uh, although it may have been once. Um, but the two main centres for making of these blades, as far as I've seen, were Klingenthal and Chateauleroy and some being made in Saint-Étienne, but Saint-Étienne seem to have made more bayonets and firearms. Um, <clears throat> right, so this blade has a double filler rather than a single filler. Is there any big difference between having one broad filler and, uh, in the French case, a broad filler and then a narrow filler? I don't know. Um, I haven't conducted uh, extensive testing, but I will tell you that the French blades are very stiff it may possibly contribute to the stiffness. It may increase the stiffness of the blade in the thrust. Um, however, it does also increase the weight very slightly, I think, because essentially rather than having one thick ridge here and one thick ridge at the back, you've now got two thick ridges at the back. So I think that pound for pound, in terms of the length of the blade and the breadth of the blade, the French cross section is gonna be heavier than the British cross section, although, that's the disadvantage. The advantage is that I think you gain stiffness. So they've added a bit of weight to add to the stiffness for the thrust. And it is definitely a good thrusting weapon. You can see that the point is in line with the hilt and uh, it's um, although it's got a slight curve on it to facilitate the cut very slightly, um, it, it is more or less a straight weapon. It is 
a, an effective, it is an effective thrusting weapon. And there is usually, as on the British swords, a very slight cant to the grip, meaning that when you grip it with the thumb up, the point comes more easily online with the forearm. Um, so the final thing I want to say about the blade, I talked about the fullers and the weight and the stiffness, is um, the length. French swords tend to be, or French infantry officers' swords, tend to be shorter than British ones. Um, now, um, that being said, there's a lot of variation between makers and there's variation between individual swords. So it's not always the case. You can find longer French ones, you can find longer British ones, and you can find shorter of both. However, this French one is fairly typical, and as is typical, it has a 30 inch blade. Now 30 inches is pretty short by British standards, okay? But the standard British infantry officer's sword was 32 and a half inches. So two and a half inches further, which is about five centimeters extra length on the tip. I think part of the reason why the French, some of you going, oh, the French are shorter than the British. I don't know that that's necessarily true. I think there's maybe like half a centimetre's average height difference. Um, but I think the main reason why the French infantry officer's sword was made shorter was to keep the weight down um, because it's a stiffer, thicker, essentially, blade. So because it's a thicker or the cross section has got more volume in it, you need to make the blade a little bit shorter so that it doesn't become too heavy. At that point, I'll just speak briefly about weight because I weighed this. Now, I have always known that these 1845 pattern French swords feel heavy-ish in the hand, but they feel they've got quite a lot of authority and I quite like that extra weight. But they, they feel a good weight to me. But I was surprised when I weighed this that it is 1000 grams. Now that's not, uh, I have British swords of a similar size that weigh the same amount, but they are unusual. Most British swords of this type of, of for infantry officers, for example, tend to only weigh about 900 grams. So the French sword for its size, remembering that it's only got a 30 inch blade, the French sword is quite heavy, um, but it is stiff. You know, there's always a plus and with, to go with a minus. Now the British sword has a lighter, more nimble blade. It has definitely less mass than the tip. You'll notice that the British blade transitions from being fullered and then about 12 inches from the point, about, um, yeah, let's say 25 centimeters from the point, um, it turns into a, what we call a flattened diamond section, essentially double-edged. So if you imagine a double-edged medieval sword, the end part of this sword is like that. Whereas the French sword, you will see the fuller continues all the way to the tip, as does in this case, the Montmorency secondary fuller at the back. So they are quite different um, blade sections, especially towards the tip of the blade. And what this means is that the British sword is very much, if we just sawed off that end of the blade and we sawed off the equivalent length on the French sword, the end 12 inches of blade, or 10, 12 inches of blade, is much lighter on the British sword. The result is that in the hand, the British sword feels a lot more nimble. Funnily enough, it feels more like the earlier 1822 French sword. So the British sword's longer, pound for pound it's slightly lighter, um, and it's more nimble. Um, the points of balance, let's have a look at the points of balance. So again, they all vary between examples. This one, just grab my tape measure. Um, so this example, so this is an example incidentally um, marked to the Bengal engineers. I actually know the officer who carried this during the Indian mutiny um, and he went on to serve in India. He in fact was one of the people responsible for building a lot of the railways in India. Um, but he started out as a junior officer during the mutiny. So it's four and a half inches uh, about 11, cent 11 and a half centimeters. Okay so yeah, four and a half, four and a half inches for the British sword. And and bearing in mind that's the 32 and a half inch blade. And then for the French sword, this looks further out to me, it is five inches out, so about 13 centimeters. So the French sword is shorter, heavier, and with a point of balance further from the hand. And the result is that it feels far more choppy, it feels closer to like a cutlass. It's not as heavy as a cutlass, but it's, it feels like more of a chopping blade. Despite the fact that it's very clearly an effective thrusting design, it actually feels uh, like, a, like a chopper. Whereas the 
Um, the British sword, the 1845 from Britain, feels a little bit more nimble in the point and a bit more like a combination cut and thrust, but ironically, Ooh, that's sharp. <laughs> Ironically, it is more flexible in the blade. Um, this is incidentally was service sharpened for the Indian Mutiny and remains still incredibly pointy at the end and fairly well edged as well. It's been well looked after. Um, I would just mention briefly as well, so the hilts. Um, this is not a typical example of its time uh, because it doesn't have the folding inner flap. Okay, if I just grab another sword to illustrate that point, this sword is not is a non-typical blade, but you can see that the British sword from 1845 to 1850, uh, 18, late 1850s to 1860, let's say 1860, 1845 to 1860, had a folding in a flap to make it more convenient to wear. Um, but from about um, 1860 onwards, that was abandoned. Um, universally and a solid guard was instituted instead because it's stronger. This is a pre-1860 sword, obviously it dates from before the mutiny, um, uh, in fact it dates to uh, dates to around 18, early 1850s I think. Um, so not all swords from before 1860 had that folding inner guard, um, some of them were solid as this one is. Um, so to sum up, they are fundamentally similar sort of swords, okay? But the general difference between the British 1845 and the French 1845 is that the French sword, both have brass hilts, both have steel blades, of course. The French sword tends to be shorter and tends to be heavier and stiffer, okay? Stiffer and heavier often go hand in hand, not always. Um, but um, in this case, it is, it is the case that the French swords tend to be, and as, again, I'll reiterate, not always, they do vary, you do get light French ones, you do get heavy British ones, but they tend to be shorter, heavier and stiffer, okay, these French ones. Finally, just to finish off, between the hilts, um, there is not a big difference. The um, British sword definitely provides more hand protection. The brass guard on the British sword it covers more area. But I would say the French sword guard is probably stronger. So you'll notice the brass that the hilt is made of in the British example is slightly thinner, slightly slimmer than the French one. The French one is more chunky, but, the, but as you can see, the French one is smaller in terms of the surface area and especially from the front, the way you're looking there, but equally looking point on as well. Point on the British one's bigger, edge on the British one is also bigger. Okay, in terms of the grips, um, the fundamental difference is that the French sword has a separate pommel cap and the British sword has a pommel integrated with a back strap. The British one is a stronger construction. Some people would argue that the back strap makes for a slightly slippier grip. I don't personally agree. I find the French sword is just as slippy as the British one is. If you're on campaign, as John Musgrave Waite advises in his book, you should wrap the grip with something of a more grippy nature, a bit like how modern sports people, including people in HEMA and fencing, wrap their sword grips with something like tennis wrap to give it more traction. They did the same thing in the 19th century. When they were on campaign, they often wrapped the grip with waxed cord or similar. So the British, sorry, the French grip is made of wood or horn, and it is essentially oval in shape with no back strap. The British one, however, has a back strap all the way down. It's wood inside with shagreen or shark skin on the outside. Now, I would say that the British swords are a more expensive construction, okay? The, in terms of uh, the materials, I think the British swords, more money went into them. There's shark skin in there, the wire is much more fancy on British swords. The guards are finer and more detailed castings. And British swords always have detailed etching on the blades, which French swords very, very rarely do. French swords are much more basic and utilitarian. For that reason, some people prefer the French swords. They do look more like um, issued weapons, whereas the, the British swords are very clearly private purchased and very fancy and decided to sh you know, show off your status. But as weapons, I don't think there's anything really to pick between them. I have, I have said on a number of occasions on forums and elsewhere that I think the French infantry officer's sword is almost perfect in its blade design, not its hilt design. 
Do I still stand by that statement? Yes, I'm a big fan of it. I, if I'd been a British officer in, um, say, 1850, 1860, I would have been quite happy to have a French blade on a British hilt. They are damned good blades, and there's no patriotism involved here at all. I don't feel any patriotism at all towards the 19th century, or indeed really to today. Um, the, um, the swords are the swords, and I'm just judging them on that basis. I think the French have a fantastic design. What the British design has over the French is the fact that it's a bit lighter because of the cross section, it's a bit lighter for the length. So you can have a longer blade that actually weighs slightly less, which in some situations could be good. However, I would say that the French blade has a lot of authority, hits with a lot of authority, and is a very stiff and robust and strong blade. So, I am a fan of both models of sword. I think the hilts are definitely, I think the hilts and grips are definitely better on British swords from a utilitarian point of view. They cover more area. Um, and I think they're better grips in general. Um, French swords always get loose because of the way they're constructed. Uh, British swords do sometimes get loose, but usually don't. So the British construction seems to be better. But the blade design of the French sword, I do really, really like. And whilst I do like the British 1845 blade, I think the French 1845 blade is really, really good as well. So different swords, for similar contexts, but they came up with slightly different solutions to solve similar problems. There we go, I'll let you judge which is your favourite. Feel free to post below and give me your views on both, which you think is the nicest sword, or indeed if there's another model of sword that you particularly love. And uh, I will see you for the next video. Cheers folks! Thanks for watching, please subscribe, we have extra videos on Patreon, and you can follow us on Facebook.